Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Quest Love Supreme. I am your host, Quest Love. Uh, this is Team Supreme. Uh, Laia, how are you? How's I life? Am doing. Mm. <laughs> I'm you doing know something? Good. What? It, it, okay. I want to know how many rooms you have in your house because I think every episode you have a new. Are you in like a 19 room mansion? Stop saying that. This is my house. Just the last time we spoke, I was somewhere else. In Jamaica, but you have more house. artwork than any human I know. Yeah, you've met my met my my parents. So yes, I do. I got shoot. I'm surprised I don't got a picture of uh, our guest on my wall somewhere. Yeah, I see. Your dad gave me one at uh, where was where we at at Bethesda of yourself. One of your aunt Deanna, um, and and your dad and Melvin Lindsay. Ooh, Ooh, mystery voice. Should've okay, yeah, mystery. Okay, hope, okay. okay. Who was that mystery voice? Hey, uh, Steve, how how are you, bro? You know, if you delete something off an iTunes playlist, all you gotta do is hit <laughs> Apple X, and it all comes back. App, you know what Apple X? You know Command X. I mean, help a brother out. Anyway, <laughs> I, oh, I, delete. Yeah, I leave that's, early. That's, that's I leave early one day in fourteen years, Steve. Yes, somehow Steve. a playlist gets deleted. In in the history of the Tonight Show. Sugar Steve has been a constant presence almost every day, and the one day he leaves, things mm. don't fall apart. I kept things together, so yes. <laughs> oh, I had that to... was so cute. Things don't uh, fall what's apart. What's up, everybody? How y'all doing? Hey, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what up, Fonte? That's a nice song title. It it was a good album title as well. Our guest today, um, she's an extraordinary singer songwriter, uh, an unsung singer and songwriter, I shall say. But for those that know already know she's totally sung so um you know if you grew up around uh the philadelphia area such as i i mean you know i went to school at 315 broad street right in the heart of the epicenter some of the greatest music ever what's going Hi, on Miss Jean? it's very nice to meet you lovely meeting you yeah, my uh, my aunt, she was a big fan um, of your records, and um, I would always go to her house and like play your stuff. And I just always remember um, just your album covers. You just always look really classy, Ooh. really pretty, and um, just always just um, just a really uh, a really classy singer. So uh, it's it's really an honor to sit with you today. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, and I appreciate your aunt your aunt educating you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, our guest. Today is an extraordinary singer and artist, especially for those who grew up uh, around the Philadelphia International Sound. Uh, I'm one of those people. I went to school right next door to Philadelphia International Records on Broad Street way, way, way back in the day. Um, basically, our guest today, um, you know, I was introduced to her via my uh, father's illustrious uh, record collection. A lot of jazz in there. And of course, you know, the black jazz label. Um, and I will say that uh, all the albums of our guest today and uh, her former husband, Doug Karn, definitely played uh, a major role in my my personal growing up. Um, basically, just some of the best, what I call spiritual jazz. I mean, there's so many titles for it. Some people say fusion uh spiritual jazz i don't know what you call it but um there's also a point in the 70s when our guest today um became part of the incredible stable of of artists that contributed to the sound of philadelphia helmed by kenny gamble and leon huff um with such legendary songs as you know free love and don't let it go to your head and my love don't come easy and then of course um you know the uh on Omni, the immortal, uh, closer than close. Not to mention, my my song was the flame of love. Like, there's so much to talk about, but um, you know, April is Jazz Appreciation Month, and um, basically, our guest today, she makes jazz, she makes R and B, she makes disco, she does it all, and she's worked with all the legends. All the legends work with her: Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, Jerry Butler, Eddie Levert. Uh, Phyllis Hyman, Earl Garner, Billy Paul, Dexter Wanzell, The Temptations, Grover Washington Jr., Rick James, Dur George Duke, just everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, so overdue, 
Mm-hmm. Our guest, the incomparable Gene Carr to Quest Love Supreme. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for coming. Ba-ba-ba. How are you? I'm wonderful. How's everybody? Doing We're great. Well. We're great. Okay. Um, massive fans of yours. And, uh, you know, I thank you for doing this. Um, you know, with with a lot of our guests of late, um, with just how the music industry is built, um, mostly celebrating, um, you know, a, a certain type of mainstream artist and really not giving light or shine to artists of, of, of uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like the old grumpy uh, music lover, but, you know, a lot of artists that have substance or something extra to give, you really don't read that much. And I don't recall ever like reading in-depth interviews with you at all, but you know, I'm so familiar with your work, but you know, you don't get to see um, your artists in some of these mainstream publications that do music. So I, I thank you for uh, finally granting us the, you know, just the honor of 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 getting to interview you. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Number one, uh, Miss Karin, could you tell me your first musical memory? My first musical memory, yeah, perhaps. Oh, um, I guess in church, uh, Greater Mount Calvary Baptist Church, uh, maybe singing solo in front of the adult choir. Uh, I must have been four then. Um, because I remember, let's see, I think the song must have been, um, yeah, because I think Mahalia Jackson had done it. Um, one of these mornings, um, one of these mornings I'm going home to live with God. And I was just a little kid, you know. Okay. Um, but I think that might have been my first public memory. Now I did a lot of stuff at, I remember a lot of stuff at home that I would do when somebody would visit us. My mother said, I would give them a concert. She said, I'd put on my ballet slippers and I'd stand in a plie position with my uh-huh. hands like this and then give them a concert if they, you know, if, if my folks asked me to. So that, that was just a typical occurrence because you hear that a lot. You hear about like, Cecil Franklin waking up Aretha Franklin at three in the morning, like entertain the guests, like sing something for them. But so your parents were like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't mind, you know, so yeah, they were cool like that. Okay. What city, what city were you born in? I was born in Columbus, Georgia. I was raised in Atlanta. Okay. It, it's weird. Like a lot of, um, artists that represent philly international in my mind they're always from philadelphia even though they just record for a philadelphia label so you know it's kind of a yeah i've always point. been a part-time philadelphian well for 50 years now so I think you I live there currently right now you still live there half the time here and half and the rest in atlanta okay okay so you, you never lost touch with your your home roots or any of that those oh, things. no, no. Okay. Um, so b- having been raised in the church, especially with down south, um, how does, like, what is your relationship with secular music? I know that for, a, there's a lot of generation, generational blacks that grew up in households in which, like, secular music is somewhat uh, taboo or not allowed in the household was your household that sort of that way or? You know, I've, I've learned that that's the case with a lot of, a lot of singers. Um, but thank goodness it wasn't the case at, at my house. Cause my dad loved music, you know, big okay. band, new Orleans jazz, you know, preservation jazz, R and B. So I, I was never pigeonholed where, where music was concerned. Uh, I started collecting records, you know, with the little uh, record player in the little box 
mm-hmm. with the little snap on there. Right. I started collecting records at I guess five ish, and they never they never limited the you know the records I could buy. What were some of the records oh. you were buying at that time? Oh gosh, well my dad had a record store on Auburn Avenue. Ah. Uh, uh-huh. Okay. It was with a cab company and a moving company and employment agency. So all I, in one? Yeah, in one building. Okay. And I yeah, it was right down the street from um Big Bethel Baptist Church, and it was two blocks down from Ebenezer Baptist Church. Um, and so I got, you know, I got to sell records too, because my brother and I would come and, you know, and work for my dad. Sometimes I was dispatcher, you know, for the cab company. And then sometimes I saw records and it, you know, it was just a whole plethora of activity that, that we got to do. But I don't know. I, I think I think selling records was the most fun for me because if somebody comes in and asks for a record that we didn't have, I had to write down the artist and and my dad would pick it up. At the at there were one stops mm-hmm. where the record stores would you know they got the the uh, manu the pressed records from I think then they had a pressing plant in Canton Georgia and and that that's how we you know that was the chain of command for 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 doing records I think that was the most fun the most fun growing up and it was down the street from the Royal Peacock. It was like two doors down from the Royal Peacock. So when artists would come to perform the Peacock, I would slip out and go see their sound checks Mm -hmm. because the owner of the Peacock was, you know, a friend of my dad's. In fact, I remember talking to Ruth Brown and telling her um, that I saw her do a sound check uh, because her son sang, he was... He's, he's a, he was a guitar player uh, a few years ago on one of the nighttime shows. And he had this amazing voice because he did a demo that I, um, that I eventually recorded. And so Ruth Brown and I got to talk because he put her on the phone. And I told her, you know, I, I remember you, you know, when, when mama, he, he treats your daughter mean, was, mm-hmm. you know, was a big song for her. And right. she loved it. She absolutely loved the fact because I was I was a little kid. Wow. I'm, I'm okay. Wondering, so, aren't I? I'm, no, I'm deviating. No, 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 no. Oh, this this thinking, is exactly this yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is a this is literally what our show is about. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned for the longest I couldn't figure out the proper title. So whenever I uh, whenever people ask me about my record collection, I never knew the the proper title of those dealers were called one stops but um oftentimes like when people ask like how do you collect so many records i think they think that i go out and actually purchase like individual like two hundred thousand records where now you know a lot of those owners of those one stops um either their widow widows or you know or their family don't know what to do with them so usually there's like 30 or 40,000 pieces lying around and then maybe a guy like me will purchase it if if it seems interesting enough and that sort of thing so if you can I, get to them before the british come cuz they can, a lot oh of oh everyone come, yeah come to yeah. america every year to to you know get the the great records you know yeah they, they, japanese dealers british people like it, it, every place but the united states really treasures like you know i mean there's some people in the united states but for the most part you but that's also interesting. You know how we are with our treasures sometimes. Yeah, I know. We're di- we're a disposable country. <laughs> um, so okay, so that makes a lot of sense to me because normally uh when our guests come on the show, the common denominator is that most of them have been DJs, but you've worked in a record store, which basically means that you're getting the same education as a DJ would, explains a lot of your you know, of, of your illustrious range as far as like the world of jazz, the world of soul, the world of blues, like all the music that you sing. And now it makes also sense mean, to me. Does it also mean like your dad was a man? Because like 
record store owners were the man in the streets, right? Like they had a lot of respect and access and whatnot. Yeah, well, the street that my dad's business was on, Auburn Avenue, was the, the seat uh, for that part of town of Black business. Um, yeah, in fact, okay, Gladys Knight's sponsor, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Alexander, T.M. Alexander, was um, was his his uh, realty company. He and Mr. Mm. Galloway's realty company was right down the three doors down from you know from from my dad's business, and and I remember you know we knew from the inside that that T.M. was Gladys Knight's sponsor, and I I knew of her, and then I got to see her on Ted Mack's original Amateur Hour. Yep. 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 Yeah, I remember the first time I, we got a request for for their record because um, I had to write it down, you know. Um, and it was it was every beat of my heart. And on the on the B side was Darling, which was only the tip the 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 uh, pips. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, and Dar Darling was just the, the pips, and. Uh, and on the other side was Gladys Knight in the pips. So, yeah, yeah. I, uh, but I didn't know that was part of the hierarchy that, you know, record company owners were the man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? The man in the street. Because there were businesses all the way down the street on, on Auburn Avenue. How, how long did, did he keep that business up? Like, was that oh, a majority remember, of your life or... I remember when I was 12, uh, that was when when I ordered Darling. I must have been 12 then. Mm -hmm. um, and as a then up up to to uh, teenagehood, I performed at Big Bethel uh, Baptist Church, which is, like I said, two blocks down from Wheat Street uh, mm -hmm. Baptist Church and and one block down from Ebenezer Baptist Church, which was Dr. King's church. Uh, so did you ever get to see him in person? To see who? Dr. King. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, my brother, Dr. King, my dad had a cab stand, you know, at, at uh, Big Bethel Baptist Church. And that's where you pay for slots for your cabs to to sit. Uh, so that after church, after choir rehearsal, all those places, all those events, um, people can come out of the church and a cab's waiting. They're like like they do at the airport. Okay. So so um, and but Dr. King could park anywhere. And my <laughs> brother, my brother used to used to wait for him to park at when he would park at at um, Big Bethel, and he would walk him down two blocks to Ebenezer. Because he was, you know, he was, now, nah, he was the man. And I remember my brother was so thrilled because this was before, uh, a couple of weeks before the March on Washington. Mm, okay. And, and, and my, my brother, I mean, he was literally shaking when he told us about the fact that Dr. King had told him where to meet them to, to be on the bus to go to the March on Washington. So, yeah, to answer your question. Wow. You got to see him. That's incredible. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Who? And I, I did, and after, after he, um, he passed away, I did numerous, uh, Mrs. King would call on me to do, to do numerous activities, sing it, you know, on, on um, ecumenical uh, Sunday, uh, when they would, you know, honor him, mm -hmm. uh, and to sing, you know, at the, at the church, etc. Yeah, okay. and she invited me to the second march on Washington. Yeah, I feel like I remember that. Wow, wasn't that in the eighty? That was yeah. well, the second march. The that was to make his uh, thing a, ho his, his, uh, day a holiday. Oh day yeah, holiday. I went to that. Yeah. I marched. I marched during that. Yes, okay, I remember when you were one. You're vocal style like you have a very very rich 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 tenor yes you've 
can sing the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. Um, who was your inspiration as far as like your your singing style? Who did you gravitate towards? Hmm. Uh, oh, it was different periods of, of my life. Um, and, you know, I was influenced by, by various and sundry singers and horn players and keyboard players. Uh, I remember seeing Aretha. How old mm. was I then? Uh, she was traveling with her father, Reverend C.L. Franklin. Uh -huh. And she they were at the city auditorium, which belongs to Georgia State now. Okay. Uh, and and she, um, she sang a song called In a Land Where We'll Never Grow Old. And by then I was playing piano for church choirs. So I put that in my in my repertoire and always remembered her for that song. And I've sung it at funerals from, like I said, from the time I was an early teenager till till I guess a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I sang it at a funeral as well. So you were just the go to the go to person. I, I guess, well, but, but Atlanta was so full of wonderful singers. Okay. Whoa. Yeah, it was just one among, among so many. In the beginning? Extremely talented. Were you, were you, um, hmm. Interesting. Were, were you at all, um, somewhat hobnobbing or, or crossing paths with any other, future legends that we might have known of known of at the time period? Well, let's see. Because uh, you never think of it that way. Uh, <laughs> or who started out? That's what I was just thinking. Like, when you were in Atlanta, who, who were the singers in Atlanta? Well, there were lots of blues singers. Okay, the Tams. Um, as we stroll along together. The Times! Oh! Oh, that's the times, but Atlanta. That's my football. uncle. What? So in love. What? Uh, Billy Billy Jackson. Come here. Uh, Billy Jackson, who produced that song. Uh, that's yeah, one. Of, that's one of my uncles. It's the last less exclusive. Last yeah. date I did with with where Billy Paul performed. Um, mm. It was in in London. Uh, the times were on there. Oh, okay. And but I think the Tams were an Atlanta group. But okay. I, I gave they, them the wrong song. So yeah, oh, I mean, but for you though, like, when did you? Was it a thing where you just out the womb singing, or like, what? What? How old were you when you made the decision that this was going to be your profession? This was going to be your your calling. You know, I guess I never really made that kind of decision because I do. I did sing, my mother said, before before I could remember. I remember vaguely some of the little concerts I did for folks that would visit us, you know, relatives and stuff. Uh, and I remember uh, being in the church choir and, and singing solo before the church choir. Uh, but I never made a decision. It was, I guess it was even a fate in college. complete. Even in college, right? Like even in college, you were you were singing. It was made. The decision was made for me because I got, you know, I got scholarships, you know, for music scholarships, um, and academic scholarship. The school that I chose, Morris Brown, I got a, a scholarship for academics, and I got one, a vocal scholarship, a music scholarship. So. I was going to be doing that for the rest of my life, whether I knew <laughs> it or not. I never made a, a decision. Um, I think it was just God. You know, I, I hear another God thing that it. we have in common, that uh, you and I would have been former Juilliard students, but yeah, we had a different yeah. calling. So what was your decision to not go to Juilliard? I fell in love with Doug Karn, and we eloped. To Hollywood wow. and got married. And that's how old were you? We, how old were you guys when y'all did that? Uh, 20. Oof. Young. Well, no, we were just, we, no, we were late teens, uh, but we started the family. You know, I was 20 
Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so you had that, that kind of fate as well. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, <clears throat> at least my dad planned on me going to either Juilliard or Curtis. He, he wanted me to be in classical music cause he thought that was, that's what my know, folks thought. A respectable, I sang, I, a respectable art form. Like, yeah, because I, I sang classically, you know, all the right. major arias and stuff, you know, the, the Messiah and mm. Seven Last Words and, and, right. and so it was, it was understood that I would probably teach music in a college. What is this you, Russian thing? I'm sorry. I know that's in there too. I, w I did not know this about you. That you oh, also yeah. that started early on when you were younger too, the Russian singing? I um we were on a in, in high school, mm -hmm. um we were on a in a special experimental program of program of study mm -hmm. uh in high school and our foreign language was Russian. So I um I took, you know, Russian all during high school. Then when I went to Morris Brown. That was the first year they had a Russian course. So wow. I, I did three years in high school and then uh, two years in, in at Morris Brown. So and you speak that was decided for me, too. But you speak professionally. Uh, OK. I... Same. You do, um, Amir, you speak Russian professionally? In the we first grade. Karuski? The only thing I remember now is uh -uh, Kus Okay, OK. <laughs> What did she say, Amir? What she say? Oh, dude, th th that was forty five years ago. I <laughs> when I like the t the type of school I went to, we learned four or five languages. We had to know like from first to fourth grade. I was fluent in French, Russian, Spanish, Latin, English, and what? Ebonics. Oh, that, that's that's yeah. hot. Yeah, that, it, it, that's a good answer. Uh, yes, it is hot. Yes. That, Whoa, that's yeah, so cool. That, I'm just fascinated. I'm like, most people take Spanish and French their whole life. They're still not proficient. Y'all take it for three, four, five years. And it's like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, well, I got, got a little proficiency in some languages because when when I perform in, in you know, in France or in Spain or or elsewhere, I would get, a, get I had Berlitz books and cassettes and i would learn to you know to talk to the audience introduce songs uh through through my my books and, and my cassette tapes so that um in fact my my second husband thought i was fluent in spanish and russian and 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 and, and, and um french and and he in fact he's told people I was fluent in those other languages, but I could just, you know, I could order food. I could <laughs> introduce my songs. I could ask for directions because I, I didn't want to be anywhere where I was that compromised. So I always learned mm -hmm. proficient, you know, just travel, travel French or travel Spanish. So yeah. you were always prepared. <clears throat> I tried to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in in your high school years or, you know, did you have any sort of dalliances at all with like pop music or just modern soul music at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I loved I loved R&B. In fact, I just found out yesterday from Laia mm -hmm. that Lee Andrews was your father. <laughs> That's my dad. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, that's my dad. That's my dad. Yeah. Actually, here, here's 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 a, a minor fun fact. We're jumping way into the timeline, but um, you know, I I he basically ushered me into show business because you know by twelve I became his band leader. But um, oh, I'll say that my cool. very first, my very first. <laughs> professional gig non-nepotism Gene you. Karn wow. Gene Karn so you had you had a musical director named Donald Dumpson Absolutely Donald and Dumpson Don, Donald 
Donald was was a sort of a, a he was a prodigy. Yeah. Because he could yeah, because when we do places like like Carnegie Hall and Avery Fisher Hall, I could throw in an aria because Donald was proficient at, you know, he knew all the arias. In fact, I remember when Pavarotti came to Philadelphia, uh-huh. Donald was the pi- the pianist that he asked for. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Donald Dumpson was, it, still is, the man. Mr. Dumpson, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. I was going to say, and so I went to the high school of creative and performing arts. Now, the thing is, when I when I thought about it this morning, that is highly, that's a highly unusual request. Like I'm trying to figure out. I mean, I I get I get miffed when my band asks of me to like let an established artist spit a hot 16 or 24 over so you know what i mean like uh blah blah blah's in the audience let him let him get on the microphone and yet all i remember was uh that mr dumpson was going to have three of his choir students and me and i think at the time it was supposed to be me and christian mcbride but I think Christian couldn't make it, so only I could drum. And we were going to be like special guests. We were going to, you you did a I think we had to play free by Denise Williams. Wow. And we okay. backed you up. And I was thinking, like, how that must have been an unusual request. Cause I'm trying to figure out like how did he how did he even make that happen? Like, yo, okay, uh, Miss Karn, I got, you know, students at my high school. Da, 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 da. we're doing this gig can they come up and sing a song with you like I, w- you didn't awesome. have to say yes and yet you did i always welcome anybody on my mic especially- see i feel bad because okay. even <laughs> even established rappers i won't let them on my stage. No. but she's well, a natural born it, educator that's too per- that's yeah. personal then that's personal yeah. i get it Touché. i get it i get it Touche, but he, Donald did the same thing with Boys to Men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, Mark at the time, Mark Nelson was one of the three. Uh, Tamika Patton, who at the time, um, mm. like Tamika Patton was the, was you know she's the she's, not was still amazing singer, gospel singer. Um, I believe that at the time she just signed to Manhattan Records when it was on Capitol, and then oh, uh, wow. yeah, yeah. Mark Mark Nelson, who was still in Boys to Men at the time, um, was the second singer, and, and uh, I believe Verdeen Brown, who's like gospel legend, uh, singer extraordinaire, like she was the the third singer. But I remember you you had a van, you picked us up from school. We've been rehearsing free all day. Why is at- she picking you up from school? Why is Jean Carpenter? Do, pick- do Do you know whose car that was? That van? Who whose van was it? It wasn't a van. It was red, wasn't it? It was, I believe it was a red. Yes, it was a red van. Yes. That was Deanna Williams' car. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Now, didn't I hear Deanna say that you used to be her assistant or her Yeah. Her, I was her um, intern at, at intern, IM. At IM. Intern. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. where we met, Aunt Jean. We met at I am. That's where really? I met him. Yeah, at I am. Oh, if, that's yo, wonderful. Laia, I want to thank you for making that the most normal way of you telling that story. Cause yeah, I did. I was. I just left it there, darling. It Friends for life. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. But um, no, I, I, I want to thank you for that. Like I've only, I could say, you know, you were you were my first gig. Uh, Phil Simon was my second, and I think my last was uh uh I forget what my last gig was before I got a record deal. But you were definitely very encouraging, very nurturing. It was easy. Oh Phyllis was hard on us though. <laughs> Phyllis was hard on us. You you were not you though. Out alive. <laughs> Yo, I, I gotta 
<laughs> I'm serious. Yes, uh, Phyllis I, was not fuzzy. Fuzzy. I'll nope. I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, at that time, I think back when I was following my dad's path for me, you know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to college. I'm gonna go to Juilliard. Like in his mind, he wanted me be, to be somewhere in between, like the next Bernard Purdy, like the 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 in demand session drummer and Purdy 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 Purdy, yeah. And basically, uh, in his mind, like you know, if I if I get a job uh, with an orchestra, like if you're if you're good, then you can easily you know you could make six figures a year and you know you could work your way up to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year mere like and that to him was like true now i'm living the dream right <laughs> i was like talk i'm trying to make that a night <laughs> like oh. not, not a <laughs> well first of all was your work with uh your former husband doug was that your your first foray into like the professional singing world or were you recording before that or uh that was my second um foray if you will um because mm -hmm. okay after doug and i when we eloped we ended up in hollywood in the same building well complex it was an apartment hotel complex as earth wind and fire they had mm -hmm. come from chicago they made that sojourn west um, and we all lived in the same in the same apartment hotel complex and everything surrounded the pool. Uh, it was hotel or it was apartment. You could stay for a day. You could stay for a year. Uh, mm -hmm. You had maid service and uh, the um, the uh, residence manager, the guy at the front desk had been on on a uh, gun smoke. So most of the folks he let in there were entertainers. Wow. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I met everybody from Reverend Ike to, in fact, I, he uh, I I subbed for his his piano organist. He came to Atlanta. I was I was I was a teenager then, um, and I I subbed for his his organist pianist when he came to Atlanta, you know, they had those, those tent things. Yeah. The revival. Those revival. Mm -hmm. tent Wait, revivals. Can, you, can you explain to our listeners who Reverend Ike was? Cause right about now there's like, Yo, straight up, straight up. <laughs> okay. So there, there are right now, the only connection to Reverend Ike that most New Yorkers have is he, his former church is still way up in the Heights, like right before the Bronx. And so, Whenever a venue like Radio City Music Hall is out of commission, uh, then you're going to have to go to what was formerly known as Reverend Ike's Church, which is like this large, sprawling building that can hold about maybe seven to eight thousand people. So it was kind of weird. Like there was a point where Radio City Music Hall was shut down for like two months. So like in order to see like Adele or Bonnie Vare, like you would have to go to the Bronx or to the heights wow. to go see them at Reverend Ike's former church and people, you know, some of those photos are still up. So I would just listen to comments of them trying to figure out like, wait, are we in a black church? Like what? Right. Why, right. Why are we seeing like a rock show there? But can you explain who Reverend Ike was to those that don't know? Well, he was an evangelist. Um, okay. And his, his philosophy was prosperity, a prosperity philosophy. <laughs> and yeah. he traveled all over the country uh, doing his his um, crusades, if you will, um, usually in 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 a big, you know, in a big covered tent style. Or sometimes they did them in large auditoriums. And I, you know, everybody knew his name because he was just very flamboyant. In fact, he lived at our for a good part of a week in our complex. And so everybody got to see him with, you know, he would come out with his guards, you know, and you have to walk the length of the pool to get to the front, to the front office to go outside. Mm -hmm. So, so it, he, he was, he was like 
<laughs> he was a star. He was an oddity, if you will, because he, you know, he had full length mean coats and stuff and, and bodyguards. And he was stuff. the first. I just of his picture. Time. I picture. Was he a pimp though? Exactly. I, I mean, no, I picture. I picture Daddy Rich, Richard Pryor. Yeah, from a car wash. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> on a on a on a mega church level. Is yeah. that a real question, Amir? Was that a real question that you was he a pimp? Was, it, was that a real question? Well, I mean, because when I see I photos know. of Reverend Ike, like <laughs> his hair was laid back. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, he, he was he had it fried, dyed, and laid to the side, you know. <laughs> and and he was very flamboyant. Um, yeah, it was like I don't know. You know what I like the way when you when you hear uh what's his name do comedy? Uh, who, he was, oh, Cat uh, Williams. <laughs> yeah, so like that, like that sort of thing. Like he can either spit religion to you or spit some game to you. You you were saying that uh, your work with with Doug was your second foray. What was your first it, as far as reporting? Oh, okay, uh, Doug and I were. Our whole philosophy was to to put lyrics to a lot of our favorite jazz classics. Vocalese. Um, yeah, yeah, because I knew all the melodies, I knew the intros, I knew the heads of the songs, and uh, you know, I sang with the, you know, with the horns. These are our records, you know, at right. home. So we put lyrics to those to those classics. Um, acknowledge. Would you study the solos too? Huh? Would you study oh, the solos as well? Oh yeah, I did the solos, note for note for note. Um, Wayne Shorter, who just passed away, Infinize, was the title tune of our first yeah. album. Wow. Um, uh, Horace Filber, Peace. We put right. lyrics to Peace. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Horace put lyrics to Peace. And Doug took it before we moved to New York. Doug took our version, went to New York to show Horace, you know, what we had done with it, because we like to get permission. Right. Um, um, and um, what's his name? Uh, Andy Bay did the lyrics right. mm -hmm. on, on Horace Silver's version of Peace. I was going to ask you, Go what ahead. is when, when you do that, you do you have because I've heard like uh, like Eddie Jefferson might have a version of a particular song and then like John Hendricks might have his version of a particular Lambert, song. Hendrix so and Ross, yeah. Right. So is like once lyrics get applied to a song, are those the definitive lyrics or is there just a world, is there a rule in jazz that a vocalist artist can add their interpretations of what they think that song should be? Lyrically at least. Well, I don't I don't know what the what the rule is, but I know on the credits, uh -huh. um Doug's name was added as you know as writer, okay. so I I don't know what the rules are, but he wanted to give the um, Lee Morgan. He mm -hmm. was gonna we put lyrics to "Search for the New Land." Mm -hmm. okay. And this is, um, this, this is this album with this beautiful afro with you and Doug and Jeannie. Is this the? You know, we took that picture. Oh no, not, not the not the one with Jeannie, but there was. One of the it was a promo picture. I don't think it was an album cover. A promo picture we took um, we took in a in a uh, Japanese garden, and it was in Philly. I'd love to know where that. Oh, that in is. Fairmont Park. Maybe it's in Fairmont Park at the Japanese house. They have a whole. Maybe thing. Doug is ready to fly to to New York. Lee Morgan was performing at Slugs, mm -hmm. this small jazz club in the village with that had peanut shells on the floor it was famous for that right and that was the week that lee morgan's wife his wife That's, came yes, into the club slugs. and yes. blew him away yep yeah we don't mean Before, jazz oh no yeah. you gotta watch that documentary Please, also because my daddy oh, in it. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. cool. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know if you noticed that. Aunt. Yep, he's in it. He's, he yeah. has one of the only people who took a photo of Helen. He, Helen Wait, him. your dad's in it? My dad's in the documentary. He has his photo and he, he is commentating in it because when Helen went to jail, she called him. Wow. Oh, wow. Because the whole story about Helen Morgan is she didn't stay in jail for too long, even though she killed a man in front of a bunch of people. She sure had witnesses. Yeah. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. 
Oh, wow. Because I think Leon Thomas was singing on that gig. Um, you know, Creator has a master plan. Cause yes, he, right. That's right. Yeah, because he did that with Pharaoh. He would do the yodel thing. He would do the yodeling. <laughs> yeah, and you know, he said he he learned that yodeling from from listening to recordings of pygmy, rich African pygmy rituals. What? Really? That, I've yeah, never that's heard us Leon get credited. I've never heard us get credited for yodeling. I've never heard black people get credited but, for but yodeling. But the yodeling that Leon the banjo talked, yodeling. It, was, yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't in the mountains in West Virginia yodeling. It was. It was this yodeling where at times it sounded like he was singing two notes, like like Layla, Layla Hathaway. Hathaway. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. So his was not your your typical West Virginia yodeling. Right. Under right. no circumstances. Yeah. It was almost it was mystical. So at the time that you moved to Hollywood, um, you know, what are your impressions? Um you mentioned Earth, Wind and Fire. I assume that this is the time that they also were working on um Sweet Sweet Beck's first album. That oh or their very I'll first after that. Sweet Sweet Beck or that when they signed the uh, Columbia. This was this was before for Sweetback, because uh, their first album, they won Warner Brothers. Right. For their first two albums, The Need of Love and Earth, Wind, and Fire. Right. Um, and one day I was rehearsing uh, lyrics that Doug and I had put to infinite to one mm -hmm. of the one of the tunes on maybe it was I don't remember which song, but Maurice knocked on the door. Uh, mm -hmm. We lived upstairs and everybody had a patio uh, and, you know, you never close, you know, close your sliding glass doors. And so Maurice introduced himself because uh, this they had never recorded either. Okay. He introduced himself. And he said, I heard the voice of an angel and I followed it up the stairs. And then he introduced himself, you know, to mm -hmm. me. Wow. Uh, and. It was, and, and he he came back after Doug got home. I told him you got to you got to meet you know meet my husband, and it was that meeting that made Maurice invite both me and Doug to record on the first two albums at Sunset Sound. That was the first studio I've ever recorded in because wow. that was the only one I knew about. Doug had wow. an album on Savoy when he was a teenager an organ album on Savoy Records when he was a teenager, but I'd never recorded before. Except there was, okay, there was an album that Morris Brown did of our choirs called Oh Clap Your Hands. Okay. And I would love to have a copy of, you know, it was a 33. Mm -hmm. and it was called Oh Clap Your Hands. Um, I, I, if anybody out there has, you know, has a copy or just, just. Make I'm already on it. I got you. Oh, thank you. That would that would complete my life, I think. You know, I, if I could get Gene Brown, I'm I'm coming to you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Gene Brown can Great. find anything. Yes. Okay. But that's what why Doug and I ended up recording Infinite in in Cali, you know, in Hollywood at Sunset Sounds. Because that was the the studio at the time. Yes. And that's where Maurice did those two albums. Did yeah. did did uh did you guys own the Black Jazz label or? I've read that that, that Doug was president of Black Jazz Records. Um, Gene Russell, okay, a musician himself, uh, started that label, and um, Doug uh, was approached by Gene to for us to you know for us to come and sign with them. Um uh, yeah, he was he was he was he was the head of, of Black Jazz Records. And Black Jazz Records was a, a, a division of Ovation Records. Dick Shorey out of Chicago was the head of the parent company, Ovation Records. And Black Jazz was a you know a custom label. So Doug never never owned it. And um, I ended up not signing with them because Russell offered both of us a contract. 
but um but it Doug thought well let's see how he treats him because the, the like the first album I think on subsequent pressings they put my name on it but it was just Doug Corn Infant Eyes right uh and subsequent pressings they uh featuring the voice of Feature. Gene Corn Gene, right y- yeah and Doug yeah. said well let's see how he treats me and then you know if this first record you know works okay then you know then i would i would sign but okay we you know we broke up and got divorced and stuff and stuff. so uh, but we did we did three albums and then doug did a a compilation like after after i left the group mm-hmm. um when i went with because i went with norman connor's performance wise and and i produced the vocals on all of his all of his his albums yes That's you how did. i got to work with and vocal coach phyllis because phyllis used so many of my my musicians it, yeah. was, it was so cool you know mm-hmm. it was she didn't even, even have to ask after a while you know my horn players she she just loved loved my musicians and i i got to work with her vocally and she said Amir, you'll appreciate this. She said that she had no lower register. Uh What? Until she heard Infant Eye. She said that let her know she had to develop a, a, and she did it on her own. She developed this lower register on her own. Yeah, she said, because there's a line in in Infant Eye's, um, and always keep them in your heart. For love, for love, we'll teach you to care, et cetera, et cetera. And she said that line from Infinite was her inspiration and her incentive to b- develop a lower register. And she really, she did a great job because I worked with, you know, with her on all of the albums that Norman Connors produced on her and, and the ones that she sang on. Uh, the songs that she sang on on Norman's albums. Okay. Yeah. She was good. Wait, I, I was going to ask. I was like, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, did you? Because, you know, for the longest, you know, when I when when we had those records, I was five, six years old. Um, so naturally, I thought Norman Connors was the singer, not knowing like Michael Henderson and all those Everybody people. Everybody did. Everybody did. However, I got to ask you now. Um, <laughs> were you there for the uh so much love sessions his uh which song you're talking about um, uh, so all right so there's there's a all right so one thing you're going to know about me is while people are into the hits i'm a guy that's in the, to the album filler. cuts yeah me i'm too. an album cut filler guy and yep. so, so so much love is uh mm. Basically, it's like buried at the end of side two on You Are My Starship, but it's basically him doing a drum solo, but he's also singing and kind of quasi yodeling. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it wasn't my dad's it. favorite song, but, you know, I was a drummer back then, so I used to always play it. My dad was like, it was to the point where it was like, Amir, no, no much love, like no more that song. I can't take it <laughs> no, no more, but love. but. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so you gotta you research this. There, um, we did um, a cover of my my love. Um, you make me feel brand new. Feel brand new. Brand new. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, um. Oh, uh, what's her name? Um, Eleanor Mills. She was okay. Stephanie's sister-in-law. Um, oh, fabulous what? singer! Fabulous singer. She did the. She was, you know, slated to do the vocals on the song. Uh, Norman insisted on singing that first line, right. um, that first little section, uh-huh. uh, until till the only you. I guess that's a bridge. Yeah, uh, maybe mm-hmm. that's a bridge. The second part, uh, Russell's yeah, Russell's yeah. part, right? Exactly where Russell comes in, and you got to listen to that, and. You'll <laughs> now your dad didn't want you to listen to so much love, right? 
Uh Or you, yeah, because your dad was saying that wasn't up to par (laughs) for him, right? Right, exactly. Your dad, well, of course, your dad was visionary. So if you find, if you find (laughs) that, that tune, uh, Norman's cover of that tune. I'm ready for it. it I thought he was just joking. Um, Because it was like, I'm going to, you know, who are we going to get to sing, you know, that He's pitchy. first line? Pitchy is being kind. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was comparable. Okay. It was comparable. And, and I love Quincy because first thing, first thing he told me when Stevie introduced me to, to, to um, Quincy. Right. Quincy said uh, we, we were recording down the street from each other. Stevie came to see me in the studio. And we walked down the street and Quincy was recording. This was in Burbank, maybe. Okay. It was in Cali. Um, And the first thing Quincy said to me was, our birthdays are a day apart. And I said, oh, you, so you're there by the Ides of March, because mine is March 15th. And his was the 14th. Why, thank you, thank you. Laia insisted that I keep celebrating for the whole month, and I'm Absolutely. doing just that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, should be the so. year, but you know, mm-hmm. hey, why not? Why yeah. not? Yeah, yeah. Um, Quincy did a, a section on a song that he produced on somebody, and he and Norman were comparable to to each other, delivering a vocal. Wow. But you gotta, <laughs> you, you gotta find if you make me feel brand new. Oh, yeah, that's I will one. look for it. I yeah. will still look for it. I'm you sure know what? It's, it's just it's just hitting me now that you mentioned your relationship to Maurice. Um was was the the Earth Wind and Fire connection the reason why it just hit me for the first week I spent in when I moved to London. Uh, there's a DJ named Giles Peterson. He played oh, me. One of my favorite folks. One of my yeah. favorite. Mm-hmm. He DJs. He's responsible for us getting a record deal. The Roots getting a record deal. Um, oh. uh, you guys do a cover of Mighty Mighty, I think on the, the Higher Ground album. Yes. But a really hip yes. jazz version of it. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Let me tell and, yeah, that was the album that... Uh, it had some some of the stuff that was in the can, and Doug did all of that by himself after oh, okay. I left, you know, the group. Um, and he he found a ringer singer. Uh, her name's Joyce Green. That was okay. her doing the the newer songs on on the um, at Adam's Apple. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So you're, but that's you on uh, Revelation, correct? Oh, definitely. Like oh, I said, phew. some of the songs he took off of the previous album. I, I get it. Previous three albums. Yeah. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Time. Time is running out. Is one of my all-time favorite songs. I love oh, this song. Yeah. Like that. I just really wish mm-hmm. we could play music on this podcast. I, man. I I'm know. Trying, I'm like mm-hmm. trying to keep up. Like I'm hitting the Apple. I'm hitting mute and listening. Oh, shout out to everybody that's listening. <laughs> you know, just hit pause when you need to. Yeah, exactly. These records. Yeah, sorry. Uh, next, we're gonna have to do playlists specifically for yes! all the songs, <laughs> all the songs just, we mentioned. It's a good um, education. So, uh, okay, so at the time, um, and considering you a serious jazz singer or a serious singer, um, I'm left with the, I'm left under the impression that like serious jazz musicians try to make it happen in New York. And New York sort of looks at L.A. as sort of like a joke when it comes to serious jazz musicianship. I mean, Crusaders aside or whatever, but I know that the East Coast has a very snobby, and, you know, it's that way with hip hop as well. Like, we're more intellectual, more, you know, strategic with our work. But, I mean, for you, getting to Hollywood, did you feel like, all right, I can make this work? Like, um, Like, what were your goals? Was your goals to just be like, the next Sarah Vaughan, or were you like, no, I want to be on the top of the charts, or like, what was you, what was your personal goals singing? I I just like 
to be challenged. Um, I just like to, you know, to sing horn lines and 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 duel with a piano and stuff. So I never, I never had a had a a a path or anything, because 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 I on on the Earth, Wind, and Fire stuff. I did the high high stuff because that was before Philip mm-hmm. and before um uh what was her name Jessica Cleves um, Jessica Cleves yeah. and you know um Patty and I decided I guess it was one day at dinner we were saying we're going to produce Jessica Cleves because she had the most beautiful voice on the planet really? and so Patty and I said yeah we're going to produce Jessica Cleves and it it the whole the whole dream just went down the drain because I understand she um she she was married to or partners with a with a drug dealer mm-hmm. and that and she you know she inspired expired behind that but she was um the first high singer for earth wind and fire because Jim Brown you know the football guy mm-hmm. managed earth wind and fire Wow. And he managed Friends of Distinction. Mm-hmm. So he took Jessica out of Friends of mm-hmm. Distinction and put put her in in um in in uh Earth, Wind and Fire. Songs like Keep Your Head to the Sky and stuff. That mm-hmm. was right up Maurice's alley, you know, the spirituality. In mm-hmm. fact, he um showed me what all the symbols were on all their literature, album covers, on the sleeves, everywhere. And uh, there must have been maybe a dozen of them. He said, well, everybody knows, you know, knows the interpretation of these, but there were four. He said, now these four, he said, just you and I know. And he said, and we'll talk about these in Nirvana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when I get there, we're going to have a, di- a big discussion. Wow, that's yeah, that's amazing. Can you tell me about the transition to you becoming your own artist, where you're not working with Doug anymore, and you're on your own? Can you talk about the process that led you to start your solo career? Oh, okay. Um, well, after the Revelation album. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we moved to we moved to New York because we were getting offers for performances there. So we moved to New York, um, and uh, I start. We were Doug and I were working at the Village Vanguard, and Norman had just left Pharaoh Pharaoh okay. Saunders, mm-hmm. and he was starting his own his own group. And um, he had his promo pictures, you know, and he came in in the vanguard. And I remember he gave me a picture and um, he said, I'm starting my own group, you know. And so he, um, after after I um, I was totally through, you know, with, with, with Doug's situation, because mm-hmm. um, we split in, in New York. Uh, I was trying to decide. I wasn't ready to go solo per se. Um, I, I worked. I did a. I did a short tour with Duke Ellington. He was looking for a high soprano for what became his his last spiritual concert. Okay. And um, I, uh, I, a friend of of mine and I sat down. And we were trying to decide who I wanted to go with. Okay, the, the choices were Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, big band. Wow. Rossan Roland Kirk. Oh, wow. And Norman Connors. Okay. So, and I got in touch with, with all of them. I think Thad and Mel were going to Russia, or somewhere in Europe, like in a week or two weeks. And I didn't even have a passport. 
at, <laughs> at the time. And there was so much material. Didn't think I could do it justice. So mm -hmm. cross th them off. Um, and then Rastan and, and Dorthan, his wife, were good friends of mine and Doug's. So I wondered if, you know, you know how when a couple breaks up, ah, what team? Who from the, you who know, gets who, the, who the, wins the kids? Yeah, who gets the friends, you know? Mm -hmm. who, so I said, I don't know, you know, but Dorthan and I are still friends. She, she's amazing. Um, so Norman, Norman got it by default. <laughs> Wise choice. I, um, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cause, cause for vocals, you know, he became totally dependent on, on me to voice train him if need be and take him in and, and do, he would have the tracks done. Mm -hmm. McKinley Jackson did most of the arrangements. Um, and and he sometimes he would even ask if they could sound like thus and so. And he wanted me to to make um, Eleanor Mills sound like me. What? <laughs> yeah. So. So he would uh, want you to morph, or he would leave it up to you to decide the 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 vocal direction of of each artist. Well. Yeah, because he would have the tracks done, mm -hmm. uh, and he would tell me who who the singer was going to be, and like like you do an instrumental arrangement, you know, you know your ranges right. and your transpositions for your various instruments. I would become familiar with the singer, and know you know what to do with them melodically. Okay. And a lot of the backgrounds and stuff I did anyway, because it was hard to find singers, you know, to to blend and all that jazz. So you just stack it, you know, and I okay. learned stacking. In fact, Maurice White called it molting because they were just starting to overdub and multi track yeah. at, okay. when they did when they did the first two albums, the two albums I recorded on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. And I got to work with some wonderful folks, you know, Glenn Jones and. And and Phyllis and right. and and gosh, so so many and Michael 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 fact, Henderson, Michael yeah. yeah at rehearsal he'll tell because I've done numerous dates with him uh, and he would tell the the uh, musicians he said yeah you gotta listen to Miss Corn because she taught me all right <laughs> so oh, funny okay. yeah so that that was a good period that was that was a, can you please a, a period of growth for me. You've mentioned this twice, but I just really need to know about how a session goes with Phyllis Hyman and how she takes direction and how, what does that collaboration feel like? She gave everybody what for, except me. She wouldn't even curse around me. And I never, I never wow. asked for that, but, but she, I think, and I'm so grateful because, because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I just couldn't have, you know, that would have been it. We wouldn't have been friends, you know, because yeah. she, she could talk like a, like a she, platoon of soldiers. She was tough. Very, very <laughs> tough. But I have but a she, feeling she, you didn't, you didn't have too much conflict though. I feel like you were that woman. No, we never did. That, we never I mean, did. period though. Like you were the person I feel like that people went to that it was, it was never a beef with Gene Carn, Like, you're beefing with Gene Kahn? How? <laughs> right. You know, I, I don't I don't beef. That's good to know. You know, this, this is sort of a, a paradigm shift for you. Well, at least in the world of jazz, especially uh, in the mid-70s, in which you're seeing a lot of, quote, serious <laughs> jazz musicians, um, fusion jazz musicians. You, you suddenly see this, this, this sort of, this exodus to pop music was there any trepidation whatsoever or was it just a natural move like okay it's it's time to to move to the middle at least left to center and see what we can do uh no trepidation at all because i since since i was a little girl my dad loved the big bands okay so if there were if there was a big band anywhere within a hundred miles of atlanta 
my dad, my brother and I, we get in the car and we find that concert. So I loved, you know, and he took my dad was from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So so jazz, you know, preservation jazz was, you know, was a, a mainstay where he was concerned. And he played a little piano by ear and stuff. And so it was it was all it there were no lines of demarcation with me for styles, um, styles of music or genres. And with Norman needing going from uh from Pharaoh to to pop as you call it it was that was during the the fusion era you know mm -hmm. uh, Royers was doing the fusion they, they were the godfathers of fusion so it it was it was just more growth and more stretching for me it was it was delightful because i never liked being him then so was it new to suddenly hear yourself on on radio was that like a thrilling moment or was it just a struggle like eh, whatever oh no it was, it was always thrilling yeah yeah i never listened to my product i still don't listen to my product um but what? i loved it when they played it because do you when, in, when you listen to your own stuff do you proof listen only when it's time to make the next record, I will do a deep dive and like binge listen. But I I don't listen to my music just like, mm -hmm, like just oh, sit let me down listen. and for relaxation, right? You don't do that, right? Nah, not really. Me Same. neither. Me neither, because okay. because I'm proofing. You know, saying, oh, I should have done this. I should have, right. you know, I should have put three more background. You know, stack three more backgrounds. Because one on my Motown album, was it Motown album? Yeah, yeah, I did a um, this this tune written by Reverend Oliver Wells. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a spiritual tune for Earth, Wind, and Fire. They took him on a couple of tours, um, and I did thirty voices. I had the engineer wow. to bring in choir risers, to, and and. I would imitate. You stood in each spot. Yep. Yeah. What? And no. I, did, I did my own bass. Yeah, yeah. And I did some of the voices of of the elderly ladies. You know, the, wore the hats every Sunday. <laughs> who had the big wavy vibrato? The ah uh, 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 vibrato. I I just, I just remember it back. You know, and. And the engineer said, this will not work because you're going to sound like 30 versions of yourself. And I said, no, I have references all the way from my, from 12 years old mm -hmm. to put, you know, to put down. And, She's singing and, character. And, yeah. Yeah. Which song it is was, this? It was See? Fun. See? The uh, song? This, what, it wasn't on the Motown album, come to think of it. Oh. It was, um, I, it's never been released. Okay, uh -huh. it was a project that I did. It was a version of Lift Every Voice and Sing that uh -huh. I did as a fundraiser for the Apex Museum, mm -hmm. which is on Auburn Avenue, um, down, well, it was technically across the street from where my father's business was, and a block and two blocks from, from Ebenezer Baptist. Um, and I, I did that for them. It was it was uh, 45 when I did it, because I think I did it in 80 something. And then I okay. went back to the studio and digitally remastered it. Uh, yeah, it was a, it, no, it was a cassette first. And then we did it as a, as a CD. Okay. Um, and uh, it was uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And Julian Bond did a soliloquy on the mm. flip side, talking about James Weldon Johnson and his brother, uh, Rosamond Johnson, who wrote the song. Mm. Yeah, okay. and that's wow. where I had the, the 30 voices, yeah. Okay. All right, so I I'm ready for the story. What brings you to Philly International? What's the steps that brought you there? 
Okay, Eddie Green, an, an amazing keyboardist from Philly, uh, one of my favorite keyboardists, got in touch with me. This was when I was still uh, recording and, and performing with Norman, Norman Connors, uh, got in touch with me and said that he um, he was calling me for getting in touch for, for Kenny Gamble. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wanted me to, to come to Philly um, and, and talk to, you know, they wanted to talk to me about joining the label. So I, I, I went to, to Philly to the, to 309 hmm. uh, Rest to the peace. label. I get there um, to talk, to meet with Gamble. It was on the night of an Ali fight. Okay. And, um, AC, everybody had left the building and we were going to talk for 15 minutes and Gamble was going to, you know, I don't know how he's going to get there. But then I, you know, I never, I don't like fights, you know, boxing, uh -huh. any of that stuff. Bustling, boxing and wrestling and stuff. Not my stick. Uh -huh. uh, so, but we ended up talking through the whole match. And, and, and I dare say that was one of the best decisions I've, I've ever made. Because it was, it was, it was magic. It was wow. magic. So, what is the process now? I mean, at this time, you're you're joining the label in '76, when they're at you know when they're at the true like height of their powers. So, what's the? I, I guess, you know, when you join, is can you run us through like the process? Like, is there an A and R? Is there? The person, like, are you deciding which songs you want to sing from them? Are they like, hey, we have a song for you. Are you allowed to say, eh, I don't like that one? Or, you know, can we change this? Like, how much leverage do you have in terms of you being an artist there? Or are you just on the conveyor belt of proven hit makers? Well, um, it was, there was total respect. Um, okay. Gamble Gamble respected my musicianship and in the building there were the producers, the writers, you know, McFadden and Whitehead, Dexter Wansell, um wow. uh Linda Creed and and um uh Tom Bell, whom we mm -hmm. just lost. Yeah. Uh, and when I get there, Gamble would tell me, you know, first of all, don't sing anything that you don't want to sing. Don't be goaded into, you know, or persuaded, you know, you know what works for you. You know what, what fulfills you. Um, you know what works with your philosophies. And so I would go to, they will have written stuff for you. Like McFadden and Whitehead, they, they would present their songs with magic. I mean, they were they were fabulous dancers, and mm -hmm. pulling pulling the the flowers out of the sleeve. They, had they performed the song the for you. Doves. They uh, were selling it. They they were selling. <laughs> it. They, ever, yeah. they were they were a riot. I just adored them. Yeah, um, and each of the producers who had written for you, composers who had written for you, um, presented their song. And, and, you know, I'm there for probably a month, maybe more, uh, just doing songs. And, and I over-recorded, so there's still stuff in the can, um, maybe yeah. a couple of albums in the uh -huh. can. Cause, and what, um, when the, the tunes that, that Kenny and Leon wrote for me, for the, when we first started, they were in the in the room, you know, in the boardroom while I, you know, while I did the did the songs, while mm -hmm. I recorded the songs. After that, they um they let me do the recordings, and then either they bring in we bring in Barbara and Yvette and and um Carla, mm -hmm. the sweeties, uh, right to. Uh, to do the backgrounds or I would stack the backgrounds. Um, okay. And when I, when I was finished, I would take it in the office 
and let you know let Kenny or call them in the in the, in the studio and and let them them uh, hear you know what they what I'd done on this song and and give me a critique and it and it went like that. One one of my favorite songs on uh, your Philly debut record was a uh, No Laughing Matter. <gasps> Wow, yeah. What yeah. like so what what are your memories of just that first album like of recording it? It was it was an adventure. I remember the tunes that Dexter did were all experimental. Um can you talk about him as a producer cuz I always felt like being under that that umbrella of Philly International almost limited him a bit because what I knew of what he was capable of like you know, he really wanted to be like Afrofuturist, damn near Sun Ra level of yes experimentation. <laughs> yeah. But they 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 honed him back a little bit. But if you listen to like a lot of his solo stuff on his records, you can see that. But can you describe him as like a as a producer and a and a musician? What was he like to work with? Dexter was is a. Uh, a visionary, truly a musical visionary, because you remember songs like "Life on Mars." Man. Yeah, he's been t he's been telling <laughs> telling the world that there's life on Mars for what fifty years now. Right, right. Yeah, his song should be played for all the launchings. It should be a part of of the the music that they that the astronauts hear when they go into outer space. Um. He was just, just well, is such a genius. It's amazing. Like, um, okay, when, when they did, when he and Cynthia Biggs did, um, Nights Over Egypt. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Cynthia did the research on that. Um, over in the east, mm -hmm. uh, the pyramids of Giza. The pyramids in Giza. Giza. There once lived a girl. She ruled the world. The then down the Nile, he came with a smile. She was the queen and he was the king under the moonlight. Yeah, your eyes won't believe and your mind can't conceive. Yeah. Uh, Nights over Egypt, they were talking about Cleopatra, of course. And and it was everything that, that Dexter did has has roots, I mean, very deep like you said, Afrocentric roots. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really think about very. that until y'all said that. That's deep about that. Are, I really, you're right. Every song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, and in, in being in that 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 cyclone of Dexter McFadden and Whitehead and and all those writers, mm -hmm. um, have you have you? Is there a story of a tune? that you wanted that you couldn't get because another artist had it or in a song that was offered to you that you might've passed on that became bigger for someone else? Oh, uh, the only tune. And I, I guess it wasn't big for her, but McFadden Whitehead wrote a, um, wrote a tune called, I don't know no one else to turn to. Mm, okay. And I, uh, I, you know, I'm a gr grammarian, and and uh, <laughs> I, did, I didn't want to do you were it. You trying to correct them. It was just too, yeah, many, too many double had negatives. A double, had a double negative in it, and I remember, I remember, McFadden said he said, "Okay, Karn, this song is going to be so big that you're going to say, hey, McFadden, write me another double negative song.' Right." <laughs> And strangely enough, um, I, I love, love, don't love nobody. Always loved it. But I didn't want to cover it because it had double negative. Dang. <laughs> Dang. <Stupid. Yeah. laughs> but I, I covered it and it's become a theme song of mine. I have to do it every every performance. But yeah. um, I'm so glad you said that for, for the longest. I was afraid to ask in public if that's grammatically correct or not correct because you know once the song becomes <laughs> a staple i just leave it alone so <laughs> you're a stinkler um because you uh arrived to philly international 
uh, in seventy six at the uh, in nineteen seventy six. Um, at the same time that the the Jacksons had relocated to Philadelphia, did you have any run ins with them, like? during that whole recording process? Absolutely. Um, we were recording at the same time. Um, oh, okay. And they, they were such, such nice kids. Um, they, my, my then husband, Khalil, they would talk, they, they would snickle in, in the corner and look at Khalil because they said that he looked like their neighbor, O.J. Simpson. Oh, wow. Um, and, and he really does. I had never noticed it. Oh. So, so, so they 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 liked Khalil, and um, Michael was having uh, voice change problems. Okay, he was he was what he might have been twenty then. I don't I don't know how old he was. Uh, Seventy six. He was eighteen. Eighteen. Okay, but he his voice was changing, right. and there were, and we were all in the same hotel at the Latham. Uh, on, okay. on what's that walnut okay yeah on 17th at walnut um and and we we all lived in that hotel that's where my problem so, was really oh, <laughs> oh God. Cool. No, no. yeah yeah did you get to go to your prom or were you performing <clears throat> oh, oh, long dang. story oh and it, yes okay. I went. <laughs> we lived in in one um part of the hotel and they had the fire doors closed, you know, because we had instruments in our room and stuff. So right. So Michael was always in in, you know, in my suite. Um and uh he confided in me that he was cracking. Uh. There were certain certain notes on certain songs um that he would crack. And so we we worked on that, you know, because I've been a vocal coach like since I was twelve, working with those choir voices. Oh, wow! So, so we worked on we worked on his changing the enunciation sometimes, changing where he placed notes, and sometimes. And I tried to convince him to just change the notes and the phrases, you know, because he was full of full of ideas, full right. of musical ideas. But he was so stubborn about, you know, instead of instead of this figure, why can't we change it to another figure and uh. and, and, and convey the same idea? But he 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 was just stuck on certain, you know, certain figures that he had contrived in his, you know, in his head as part right. of his plan. His muscle so memory. He worked. Yeah, yeah. And and um that's when I discovered he he was a um, he was a pediatric insomniac because my mother was a pediatric insomniac. Um, uh, children who don't sleep well at night. Oh, kids! Okay, children insomniac. Yeah, all the way through through adulthood, my mother oh, my wow. mother took naps during the day because she was just roaming around the house at night. Wow. Yeah, hmm. and because um, he would uh, he would. When he'd come into my room after we'd finish our little sessions, he, I remember the first time he said, he said, I'm going to take a nap. And he, and he pointed to the floor on the other side of my bed. And I'm a germaphobe. So, <laughs> forgot. So I wouldn't even let my kids, you know, when they grow up and travel with me, they couldn't even walk barefoot on a hotel floor. Oh, no, 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 no. Mm. I started getting, getting the uh, housekeeper to leave me sheets and pillowcases and stuff. Uh, so when he, you know, when he'd come over to take a nap, uh, he'd sleep on the floor. Mm. And, and I remember hearing when they were accusing him of, of the, the of, things. of the, the children thing, I was saying, and he, and he mentioned one day to them, he said, no, I never slept in the bed with them. He said, I slept on the floor. I said, yes, I know he does. You know, that that wow. just blew me away. It wow. just hurt me so badly. Wow. Um, but that's that's uh, what what was happening when when we were all recording at the same time. So you helped him develop his pre-Seth pre Riggs. Wow. 
you you were a vocal trainer for him. Yeah, That's you amazing. know, all singers should get checked by Seth Riggs. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Checked. He's pretty. He's pretty old now. So hurry up. Well, no, there's he, he, he. There's enough lessons on YouTube that we can just go there. He's on YouTube. <laughs> Whoa, that's heavy. Uh, yeah, there's a 45 minute session of Michael Jackson and Seth Riggs uh, doing vocal exercise. Oh, that's so cool. You know, Maurice had some issues, and I and and he would he would come up, you know, come up, and I would work with him vocally, and I remember. After Doug and I had moved to New York, I heard changes. You know, I'd go to see them a lot uh, when they performed live. And and I would ask him about stuff, you know, that he was doing. I said, well, you know, you know, where'd that come from? He said, actually, he said, I went to Seth Riggs. I said, okay. And, and he said, and I said, well, it so it worked, huh? He said, "Yeah, but thing is, everything you told me and taught me, Seth Riggs told me and taught me." He said, "But I incorporated it because I had to pay him." <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah. not a paid vocal coach, huh? You're not a paid vocal coach. All this, all this coaching, not for I mean. My not for Phyllis, not for Michael. No, I was, I was getting. She was looking out for the cookout. Yeah, but was they the, was paying somebody. Else. I know, but in '76 we weren't. Oh, we, no, the, I know. Yeah, but you know, Michael. We weren't was, there yet. He he wanted he wanted me and the kids to to take him to Six Flags, you know. Wow. And and my mother, you know, told me you can't take this boy to Six Flags. They just opened. She said because. Because you don't have security, and his security wouldn't work, you know. Right. He just can't do that. So no, he was he was like a family member. My mother Aww. went to one of their concerts, and I could never get my mother to go to anybody's concerts, but mine and Patty. In fact, she, she said Patty's was the best concert she had ever gone to. Oh. I almost got jealous. <laughs> Your second best. No, no, she said it was the best. <laughs> um, Miss Jean, I wanted to ask you about uh, recording uh, two particular songs. Um, was that all it was? And um, well, of course, don't let it go to your head. But was that all it was? Um, just do you remember that session and you know what that was like? I do. I really do. Um, Jerry Butler, um, the coolest guy in music. That's why they call him the Ice, Ice Man. He literally is. Right. Um, he he wrote that one. He he gave me that one, and um, um, what was the other one? Um, it was a ballad. Um, and and it was it was so odd hearing hearing the demo with um Jerry Butler singing. You know, I'm used to hearing him him do those smooth ballads, you know, mm -hmm. um, except stuff like Western Union Man, but that was still smooth and cool and icy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was it was just so odd hearing him sing, was that all it was? And and this was at the beginning of disco. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And although we didn't, I didn't choose it for that reason, uh, but when it was, it was one take too. Because mm -hmm. I'm not a I'm not a one take girl. It's just one. I time. like to do the scratch vocals. I like to live with them a couple of days and then come back in and perfect it. You know, get it, live with it, and then then get it like I really want it. Um, and I had I had finished the the take, and Jerry said, "Well, that's that's the take." And I said, mm. "Are you sure?" Because I, you know, my old habit was to live with it and then do it over mm -hmm. and All right. perfect it. Um, what's his name? Um, Ushery, John Ushery, uh, did the instrumental, did the orchestration. Mm -hmm. That was that was a masterpiece of the orchestration. It was 
It was really good. And it was so cute seeing them in the studio, the two of him. Jerry's all cool, you know, and, and icy, like I said, and, and mature. And John Ushery couldn't sit still. <laughs> he had, you know, one of those type A personalities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was all over, all over the room. Since, so, uh, since Fonte asked you that, for the, for the When I Find You Love album, what what was mm-hmm. happening at CBS at that time? Because I felt like that's that album should have been way bigger than what it was. Was that all it was? Is a club staple? Yeah, we got. We didn't realize it was going to be, you know, so embraced by the disco world. But yeah. the disco started calling the label asking for, you know, a twelve inch. So they, you know, they obliged, of course. But um, I I don't know. They were there was a, a a conflicting period there with with CBS and and Philly International, mm-hmm. um, and and was was you know was in that came out during that period. So I don't. It might have been part of that that conflict because. Because Gamble and Huff were powerful, right. very powerful, and there there must there could have been rumblings of of envy, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Too much power. Going on. But I mean, did yeah. you feel as though they knew what to do with you? Because like, I I still feel that like a lot of those records could have been way way bigger. You know, like, they still work to this day. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe they and and felt that they they should have been, but um, Phyllis felt the same way. So, so what I, led I, to the journey to Motown? Uh, Gamble was was deciding to to do other things. He okay. came to me and said, you know, he wanted to do other things, and um, he brought his his nephew Chuck Chuck Gamble. Mm-hmm. that had the label uh and but before that he formed another label and put i know he put me on there and he put the oj's on there and maybe maybe teddy and the stylistic well. uh, tsop okay okay yeah 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 um and he was he was contemplating um doing other things at the time oh the real and estate is this the real me, estate auntie is this when he started doing the real estate stuff yeah okay yeah okay yeah yeah building you know building communities and stuff yeah and he asked me what label would i like to you know to go with because um our our executive vice president did my deal with motown so it was you know it was like handing your your niece over to you know to another family. Um, I see. Okay. Ah. Yeah. yeah, so that's uh, how that happened. An- another one of my favorite songs of yours, uh, Miss Jean, I want to talk about. It's a it's a duet. Um, I'm back for more. Do you remember? Wow. That that's right. She did do that. Yeah. That's the- right, Yikes. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was on a, that was a production of Norman Connors on, for, um, uh, what's his, uh, Al Johnson. Al Johnson, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, and they had finished Al's album, and they didn't have a hot single. So they called me. They recorded it in L.A., and so they called me. We started looking for a clincher song, uh, you know, strong, strong first single. And we found I'm Back For More on an old Tabaris album. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, and I so I thought we should do it as a duet. So I was going to use Sybil Thomas, uh, one of um, of Rufus Thomas's daughters. Okay, because he got, he's got some singing daughters, boy. Um, uh-huh. But Sybil Sybil uh, had moved to New York at the time, uh, so I ended up doing doing it as a duet with with Al. And that song, 
has been sampled more than anything I've combined that I've ever <laughs> recorded. I was just about yeah, to ask y'all that. Like, what the, what are the samples? I hear the samples in the song. I was like, what are the songs that we know from this? Uh, uh, this who, Will sample? Smith yeah, who sampled? Uh, sampled it. Well, yes, um, yeah, Will did it. Um, they kind and of there sampled are, it. When you look on who sampled, there are names of, of rap groups and rappers that I don't even know. So... <laughs> So a uh, lot guess of what? Same. Places, same. <laughs> same there? Ooh, okay, same for I me. I don't feel so badly then. Oh, okay. But you must, um, have yeah, took, but you must have took sampling well because since you said that you're on a steady evolution and you're fine with, music, with growing and going through whatever changes, when they started sampling and using it for hip hop, you were, you were cool about it, right? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. 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 Okay, because don't let it go to my head. It's like, you know, everybody loves that brand new being song. Yeah, well, don't let it go to your head. You know, one of those those message things that, that Kenny and Leon were famous for. Right. And surprisingly, little huh. known fact, hmm. they, um, I remember when Kenny gave me the song, he said, because he gave, gave it to me as a demo with him playing guitar and singing, you know, and, and, and Huff, did, did a little piano on it. Ooh. And mm. so when I, uh, he said, this, you might like this one. And he said, don't worry. Huff and I have the, have the background. And I thought that's cool. You know, so <laughs> when I finished, when I finished putting down the, the lead vocal, the final vocal, I went in his office and I said, come on, we're ready for the backgrounds. And, and Gamble said, Oh, that's okay, Gene. You got it. And I uh, said, Oh no, you uh -uh. no, 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 no. Y'all got to come sing this with me. And really? they did. You know, that's yeah, them really in the cool. background. Don't let it go. To in the yeah. Okay. What? Okay. Wait. Who's the no, 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 no? Who's the who goes the no, that, no, that, no? That was me doing all that. That's her. Oh, I mean, duh. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I knew that. I'm just okay. Wait. I, okay. So this is a one. I don't even know that's Roland Chambers playing guitar with you on that guitar scatty thing at the end. But w when you want to incorporate your scatting and whatnot, and you know we haven't interviewed the Whispers or George Benson yet, so I, you're probably the first pop scatter that I can ask this to. Um, what comes first? Like, are you singing your? And I'm talking about the the thing that you do at the end. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, see, see, does that come most, from you first, and then the guitar goes to you? Can't or? hear that I'm I'm with that. You know, don't even know that that's under me. Because what I did was, I I was just I was thinking of ad libs. Well, that was in the middle, but like it ended up, you know, being like like a an ad lib section, and right. I did I. And I don't know if it was Roland or not on okay. on guitar then, but um, I, yeah, I imitated the um mm -hmm. the don't don't ever never never let it don't let it go to your head your head. So that was you first, and then they followed you, and then he no, I was imitating. I was I was imitating his his um solo. Oh, okay. So he hmm. like oh, okay. we did on Infinite Eyes, you know, I going see. back to that period. Because like see. like like on on Infinite, um, every 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 note in the solo in Wayne Shorter's solo. Someday you will grow up. You'll grow up and have your problems, little girl. You must try to be strong. That was that was us putting lyrics to Wayne's solo. Okay. Yeah. So it was the same the same habit. Talk, talk about uh, you. You decided to do uh, if you don't know me by now. Which the irony of it is that you're not on Philly International anymore. And that's what Motown said too. <laughs> yeah. Was it your idea to do it? Or was that Motown like, oh, we have a legacy artist from Philly International, so let's bring some of that to over here? Or no, it was it was it was my my idea. In okay. fact, when um. When when I made uh, who was it? Okay, Iris Gordy and and um, Raynona Gordy were okay. you know uh, over over that that project. Yeah. Uh, 
they when I when I said I'm, I want to do if you don't know me by now, they the scuttlebutt was well, you've already left that label, so they gave me about five long play albums with samples of Joe Bat music, mm-hmm. okay, because it was like, what about us? You know, well they didn't say that, but right. I, I I got it, and and from those I chose my baby loves me. Oh yeah, I did that. Oh, okay, um, and I did another another Motown tune. Uh, but yeah, but um, if you don't know me by now, I remember telling Teddy that I wanted to cover, you know, to cover that. It, well, what I wanted to do at first was, I miss you. Oh, I miss you. Right, right. And and Teddy said, that doesn't fit you, he said, because think about the lyrics, he said, because it's got drink and drink. And he said, you don't drink. Why right. are you going to do yeah. that? Drinking, <laughs> drinking. So that's when I went to, to, if you don't know me by now. Yeah. Uh, another genius move on that album. Um, and this is kind of weird. I think the way that I discovered classic songs is I discovered the the cover first. Um, mm. <clears throat> I I knew your version of completeness first before I knew Minnie Ripperton's version. Minnie Ripperton, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. You know that was the only thing that she had recorded that I could do. Oh, because she didn't start flexing and everything else of hers was out of my stratosphere. And okay. and the week that she passed away, she um she came to see me at the Roxy. Um, oh wow! I did maybe three days at the Roxy, and it was just just a few months before she passed away. Because um, she she was telling me how she she was. He said she said I'm putting y'all down. She was because she was on CBS, right? Um, and she said and I'm going to do my own thing. She was telling me about a clothes clothing line. This was mm. way after she had had the mastectomy, mm-hmm. and um, and she uh. And that those two nights, George Duke came to see me. Um, Stevie came to see me. Uh, Sarita mm-hmm. came to see me. Chaka, um, Chaka was just pregnant with her first child. Then okay. uh, there was so many folks that I didn't know uh, came to, came to see me at the Roxy. It's right on Sunset, right at the Beverly Hills line at the okay. sign. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I know, you know, I know that for you in 86, um, you know, one of the one of the best comeback stories in music was, you know, you achieving your number one um single with closer than close. Right. And again, I I'm Flame of Love is like one of my all-time favorite songs of yours. Um, wh- generally, what was happening in '86 for you? Like, were you expecting this at all? Because I think a, a lot of times when artists are on a lot of labels and they record and record and record, and the desired results—I mean, sometimes it's like a stalled car, sometimes it's not. But this, this really, truly felt like a victory lap for you, like. Can you talk about just the whole process of making that record and what your expectations were and how did, how did it feel to come with those two hit singles? Well, it was so such a pleasure to, to work with Grover. Yeah. Um, yeah, because a friend of his, um, what's his name? He used to be on the news uh, here in Philly. I knew him. Oh, what's his name? He does, he does an ad now for, for, is it Mm. for an, no, it's for a a legal firm and his name will come to me, but he went to Morehouse and I met him um, in Atlanta, you know, when he was matriculating and he, he hooked, it was his idea for me and Grover to get to know each other. So he made the introduction and, um, and it was like, we had we were separated Siamese twins, Grover and I. We were so compatible; it was just amazing. In fact, "Closer Than Close" was the first the first song we chose 
because uh, okay. he produced two two of my albums, the two on on Atlantic, um, uh, and and we just thought so much alike, and he he just loved playing on on my product. You know, he played on just about everything on those two albums. In fact, um, on the twenty fourth of April mm -hmm. uh, in Atlantic City, the um, the uh, national National R and B Music Society is is um, in conjunction with the mayor of of Atlantic City is okay. installing the first class of of artists on the uh, Atlantic City Walk of Fame, oh. and um, I I know the Delphonics are on there. James Brown will be installed and Grover Washington Jr. Uh, so I, you know, and I've been, been in touch with, you know, with his, his daughter and his son and, and his wife, Chris, and they're, okay. they're going to be there and yeah. And, and the grandchildren. Yeah. So I had to, I had to mention that, uh, but I had um, my, my man, my then manager had put me on two labels Sugar Hill Records was one, um, and Boston International Records with um, uh, Maurice Starr. Sugar Hill oh, wow. Records had um, uh, Sylvia, Sorry, Sylvia Robinson. Yeah. And uh, he was in such a hurry, we'd get half an album done, and he was saying, well, they're not, you know, they're not doing this quickly enough, so he would get me he got me, um, he made me leave the label and got both Maurice and Sylvia to, to grant me um, unconditional releases from the label. Um, but, but of course I, I stayed with, with um, Sylvia Roan for the two albums on, on Atlantic. It was Wea then, you know, mm -hmm. Electro right. Asylum, Atlantic and Warner Brothers. Once the '90s come along, how do you how do you feel the the industry, um, especially with 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 um, with black artists? Like, how did you generally feel? Um, I, I guess with the process of you know with hip hop coming in and whatnot, uh, and you're seeing like a another generation of of artists come into the system that's kind of far away from the traditional style of what soul or, or singing or jazz music or whatever, like how do you not get discouraged by that? I think, I think because a lot of artists um, could easily fall into, uh, you know, bitterness and anger. And you, for some reason, I, I don't feel, I don't feel that from you at, at all. Like, have you been able to maintain your cool and, and sort of a, a steady pace throughout your career? Yeah, I'm, you're, you're very astute um, as an observer because because it never it never affected me negatively. I I like the fact that they they sampled me a lot, you know, um, mm -hmm. and back when you know when the when the lyrics were wholesome and cute, you know, and right. positive. I, you know, I, I embraced it as well. Uh, and, and, and they, they used uh, vintage music anyway, you know, on, right. on there. So I, I like the fact that they were introducing the, the young listeners to, to the vintage artist and the vintage sound. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was, I was cool with it. And the fact that, that I, you know, had a jazz audience, a, a you know, a strong, sturdy jazz audience, and the R and B side. So I, you know, I I could perform everywhere, you know, and in Europe, you can you can perform in Europe right. for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. They know more songs than you know. Absolutely. So I also, was I was cool. Can you also talk about too? Because I remember a time. And I'm, these are from my childhood memories, but I remember a time when you became you got into education and you were teaching, weren't you teaching at Howard? 
And you were teaching vocal? Oh, I got offers from several universities yeah. Yeah, wow. to, to join their faculty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but it was it was a bit too confining. Mm -hmm. um, okay. In fact, a couple of universities offered me, they said, okay, you can pick your, your days that you'll have classes. And they had replacements for me, subs for me, when I had to, you know, to to go to work, you know, this week, and and you know it was it was cool like that, but it, I just didn't, you know, because I was still raising the kids then, and and that happened with with some Broadway offers as well, because I couldn't couldn't bring the kids to New York. What did and you my say mother, no to? My what mother did? did not want to live in New York. Oh well, uh, yeah, that part, that part. Okay. No, very different than Atlanta. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but but the fact that I had those two very diverse audiences kept me kept me afloat, and I, you know, I and I'm glad a lot of the rappers have grown up. Your vintage rappers have yeah. grown up and and changed their lyrics, and I'm thinking that's going to happen down the road for the younger ones. You know, so there's hope. People mature. Um, That's right. I have one more question. So, can you talk about um, your work on the the Jazz Is Dead series yes. with uh, Ali Shaheed and Adrian? Oh, that was that was quite an experience. You know, um, I have hadn't done anything like that since I appeared on on an album, and you you mentioned um, M Two May, right? Uh, years, years and years ago, I think it might have been, no, it wasn't his first album. Uh, it was called Life Cycle. Okay. And um, he recorded in, at a, in Boston at the New England Conservatory. Mm -hmm. um, and he had uh, Andy Bay, Dee Dee Bridgewater, Ron Carter, so many of, of, you know, of the the top jazz artist on on this this project, and what he brought was a skeleton, a okay. skeleton, you know, skeleton tracks because it was an album, and we basically he gave us titles, and themes, um, patterns, and we basically it was extemporaneous for the most part. And not since then was I um, had I been able to do that until I got with with Ali Muhammad Shahid and mm -hmm. and Adrian Young because I get there in the studio they hadn't sent me any any music no ideas no titles nothing mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, Adrian sends get, plays me some changes, pretty avant garde changes from from most of those tunes, which was very appealing to me. You know, like like sitting in with Pharaoh Saunders or Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes right. So I, that was cool by me, but and then I had to go on mic with no idea as to what I was going to say, which I hadn't done, like I said, since the M. Tume album. Right. I, I, I composed my lyrics. I composed the melodies, just listening to the chords. Um, and the titles of the songs were all extemporaneous and off the top of my head with no prior, no prior notice, no prior conceiving and didn't Must even know that good. was how it was good it it was it was a stretch like, like exercise right like did it feel like exercise? yeah 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 it was like calisthenics yeah. for for a whole album but you did it it made you stand on your tippy toes <laughs> that's good yeah i want to thank you for um taking time out to 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 speak with us and you know we're extremely we're, we're we're lifelong fans of yours and you know 
definitely one of my favorite singers. And I thank you for uh, <clears throat> taking a chance on an unknown drummer. And, <laughs> you know, that, that had, a, that had a, 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 a massive effect on me. Tell you know. them the circle back story, Auntie, that, that, that you do now every day, every night. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, I I didn't remember you from, you know, from the from the performances. OK. I started. I uh, who is your guy? Your, your late night guy that you uh, Jimmy, oh, Jimmy Fallon. Yes. Fallon. I never watched his show. Mm -hmm. I I I passed by his show, uh, you know, channel surfing. And I saw you and your guys. Mm -hmm. I started, I, I tried to, to like his part, you know, his jokes and his guests and so on, uh, and it didn't, it didn't work. So I started recording your show, his show, y'all's show, uh, and I would, I would fast forward to when y'all broke for commercial, to you played, you know, on the fade for the commercials, and when you came back. And that I loved, and I I guess I I I it was because cellularly I remembered you. Oh, that was did nothing for me. See, yeah. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> well, I guess we're leaving the show now, Steve. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> watch tonight's show. I heard it's a hot mess. <laughs> uh, shut up, man! <laughs> the music, the music. <laughs> no, especially the music. <laughs> no, I, I thank you, thank you once again, wow, and uh, on on behalf of uh, unpaid bill, get get well, bro, and and Fontigolo, yeah. absolutely, get well, unpaid bill, Mister Steve. Uh, we thank you, and this is uh, another classic episode of Quest Love Supreme, and we'll see you next week on the next go round. All right, y'all, peace. <laughs>